Hello, Dr. Stroman here with my beautiful wife, Lisa, Dr. Lisa. <laughs> I always mess that up. <laughs> um, we're here to talk about cancer. Um, I have a, about seven hours of, of data I could share with you, so I'll try to... I'm not going to let him do any of that. <laughs> so I'll try to <laughs> make it smaller. Uh, and I did. I just looked at the post and it says, why did I get cancer? So it's a little bit of a bait and switch. I was posing the question, if you get cancer, the question you ask yourself is, why did I get cancer? Um, so I will go through lots of different things. So my, my point will be to go over some risk factors. Uh, I'd like to tell you what a normal cell looks like and what a cancer cell looks like. Um, and then screening tests, the common ones that we are all aware of, or that I'm aware of. Um, and then some other ones you're not really aware of would be the MRI test, um, a full body MRI. And then there's a new test called the Grail test. Um, and there's some color tests, or it's called the color test, or an AMBRI test. Um, it's a genetic test to see if you've inherited a risk for those. So, if you're ready. Yeah, okay. let's do it. Well, then I'm going to ask you, what do you think the biggest risk factor for cancer is? Being married to a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we all know the biggest Yeah. One. No. I... Smoking. Yeah. Yeah, smoking. But, is that just for lung cancer or all cancers? It's it's for most. I mean, it's a chronic inflammatory thing. But I, I thought the most interesting, we always mention tobacco, body weight, alcohol, ultraviolet light for melanomas, diet, and then carcinogens. But the biggest risk factor is? Smoking. Age. No. Oh. Age. Oh. So it's kind of like the same risk factor for Alzheimer's. Age. You know, age is the biggest risk factor. So you can't do much about that. But the point is to talk about all the stuff we can do about it. And uh, interestingly, for males, the most common cancer is prostate, then lung, then colon. And for females, it's breast, lung, and colon. So um, interesting. those are the biggest ones we kind of screen for. Um, so let me just tell you, a normal cell, we have 23 pairs of genes. One of those is determined your, sex, your gender. That codes for about 30,000 genes and about 1% are coding genes that code for proteins that make the structure of the cell and scaffolding and they have, uh, you know, the common genes. Um, so what we're trying to find is an abnormal cell, which is a cancer cell. So, and the point of all this is to try to catch cancer at a point where we can intervene and we can ch change outcomes. So the earlier cancer is found, the easier it's gonna treat. Um, I just think. sometimes hard, sometimes easier. Like sometimes it presents easier, right? Or symptoms it presents. Sometimes there's symptoms, but when we're doing a screening test, we are doing a test where someone has no symptoms. Okay. And we're trying to screen for an early cancer that has yet to present itself. So what age would you start that screening? So that depends on the cancer type. So we're going to go into... Well, no, this person has no cancer, no symptoms. When, as a doctor, do you tell what a patient would you say we should do kind of this general screening, even though you don't have anything. Well, that's where that's where prevalence comes into fact. Like we can screen someone at 22, mm -hmm. but the likelihood is there's not, gonna be, there's not gonna be cancer there. As the prevalence of cancer goes up between 40 and 70, that's when most of the screening tests happen. So personally in my circumstance, I got screened at 45 or 40 something like yeah. right you just yeah. said like we should do a screening and then i got this variant of unknown significance and everybody was like don't worry about it and then four years later breast cancer that doesn't those aren't linked though well, no but the screening found something right that that's that's no. not, that's the color that's that's the gene test that we sometimes do if there's family histories or if we're trying to figure it out okay. you had a family history of breast cancer although your family history is late in life so you didn't detect, they didn't detect a cancer that puts you at risk for, for any cancer. Right, right. Except for this variant, which we don't know about. Um, we'll go into that okay. later. Okay, <laughs> Just, I'm sure that they want to know when you're going to do these screenings. We're basically in your middle ages. Okay. And technically, unfortunately, so we're in a middle age. Okay. <laughs> um, so the point is to find a cancer earlier before it, you know, it, it pervades and goes and stuff. So the interesting thing about a cancer cell is it has to evade our immune system. So normally, if a cell goes awry, your body will be like, hey, what's going on? You send some T cells, which are white blood cells, it kills it off. Okay. So a cancer cell has to make, has to have changes to the cell slightly enough that it's undetectable by immune system, yet it still can grow. So usually it has to evade your T cells 
has to start growing its own vascular supply because it's it's growing abnormally because it needs um, veins and arteries for fuel. A for fuel, yeah, mm -hmm. and then it has to overcome you know some adverse microenvironments because when that cell starts to divide, it's it's metabolically super active and it has to sort of figure out how to survive without you know it just survives. That's what it is. It's like a warrior. Um, and some uh, interesting doctor said it was like a spinning spinning of a combination lock of DNA errors. How many errors do you think it, you see in a, in a cancer? How many DNA errors do you think? Out of how many? Uh, I mentioned 30,000 genes before. Oh, okay. Out of 30,000 genes, how many do you think? Five. So between 30 okay. and 300 mutations. Wow. In, in one cancer cell. So, um, and out of those, you're kind of right. There's usually main drivers, there's usually you know, a few to a six main drivers, but there's usually multiple mutations in that cancer. It's like the one one kid in your house that's like in a bad mood and it changes everything else. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Not that, that I one. have personal experience <laughs> with that. Yeah, so that one, it, again, usually you have to cut, it's, a, it's just like a series of bad luck, basically. You, you, you get some changes. There's a couple genes that I'm going to talk about. There's the one gene called the tumor suppressor gene, and that has to be hit early. And if it's not hit early and these other mutations happen, again, your body identifies it, kills it off, you're good to go. Um, so there's like a tumor suppressor gene. Then you have to hit these weird oncogenes that promote growth. And then the then boom, fire. It's like fire. Hmm. Um, I was just doing, the tumor suppressor genes are like the ones that you hear of, the BRCA gene, the BRCA gene. So if you inherit, and that's one of those tests that you did, if you inherit one of those genes, you basically get one from mom, one from dad. If you get, if you get one that's off, then you only really need another mutation for this one. So when you have those BRCA genes, you're just higher risk of getting cancer. It doesn't say you're going to have cancer, just says your risk is higher than the general population. So anyway, for a cancer cell, it has multiple errors, sometimes in the hundreds, four or five main factors that are driving it. Um, and it just lets that cell you know, grow and it has, has no, it doesn't behave like a normal cell. No natural predators. Right. There's no natural predators. It's its own predator. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and what was I going to say? Yeah. Yeah. And so early growth of the cancer, usually it happens without blood supply. And that then again, another gene abnormality happens. Then it sucks in, you know, gets gets more arterial supply and then it can, then it can grow. Then it can spread, actually. So how many cells do you think it takes? I didn't. You did not tell me I was here for a quiz. Okay. <laughs> it's kind of fun quizzing you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Because I don't have my glasses on, I can't see. Your yeah, you can't see anything. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm gonna say yeah. a cc is a, a you know a cubic centimeter, pretty small, right? Okay. One centimeter. Mm -hmm. So typically, to find a cancer, how many cells do you think are are there? Oh, that's right. I know this answer. You do. Yeah, it's usually like four centimeters or three centimeters to it, be palpable. To be powerful, it's in a breast, it's probably about a centimeter. Okay. In other areas, it can be more complicated than that. But there's about a billion cells. Oh. So by the time you find it, so like, for example, on a, on a breast, if you find it and you're like, oh, I feel something, and it's about a centimeter, which isn't, you know, that isn't that big, there's already, there's already a billion cells, and it probably has been growing for years, which is surprising. Um, and so we're trying to catch cancer when it's, you know, a hundred million or a billion cells. It's a different, and that survival rate when it's early is like 95, 99%. If that becomes 5 billion cells and it's everywhere, then it's much harder to sort of get under control. So again, we're trying to find it when it's small enough. A hundred million or billion cells. Yeah, this right. It's kind of, it doesn't, small. it sounds, it's a, kind of crazy to think about yeah. a billion cells in there. Yeah. Um, and then what is metastasis? Metastasis when it spreads to other organs which I hadn't really thought about. And if a lung cell, it's used to its lung environment. It's used to having air and oxygen exchange and CO2 and you know, there's a micro, micro environment to the lung. Now that cell to live in a liver or to live in a bone is, is a whole series of, you know, it, it has to have so many changes that it can be able to survive in a liver or in a bone, which has a whole different set. So when you say like these billion cells, one cell breaks off, so and it travels in some sort of highway, right. which is usually like lymph. the lymph system, right? Or blood. And mm -hmm. then how does it like decide where to land and start? It doesn't decide, so it has no consciousness. It has, 
<laughs> I'm thinking the magic school bus, right? Yeah. Like we're, we're traveling yeah. down. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That magic school bus has to be able one to survive in the in the in the bloodstream, mm -hmm. and not everything can. So that's why, again, when you see a cancer or you see a you see a cancer on a mammogram or something, it's not homogenous. It's not. There's probably like hundreds of different cells in there. So like, um, not every cell of cancer is going to be exactly the same. And those mutations keep happening, and when they keep happening, boom, then it has an ability to travel in the bloodstream. Okay, well, one or two cells divide, gets out in the bloodstream, now it can survive in the bloodstream, but then it can't survive where it lands in the liver, mm. so then it fails. Well, then those cells keep dividing. Another cell has a capability to live in the bloodstream, goes in the bloodstream, goes around, around lands in the liver, doesn't survive, dies. And that's why it takes a little bit of time for that cells to keep mutating to the point to where they have an ability now to land in the liver and then boom, now it can land in the liver, now it can start to grow in the liver. Got it. So then you have breast cancer in your liver. Then you have breast cancer in liver, which is metastatic. That's right. metastatic cancer. So right. it's 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 technically very hard for a cell to go, grow somewhere and then be able to go to a bloodstream and survive. And then there's another thing to actually land where it's gonna land and then survive in that micro. Right. So, and they're not all created equally. No, all again, in, in a yeah. cell, in, in a breast cancer, there's hundreds of different mutations, and every cell is not identical. Right, but it, and all the cancers are different, also. And every cancer is different. Yeah, yeah. every cancer is different. Um, so that was kind of interesting. Um, and you know, in, in a cancer cell, um, you have a lot of text on this. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of it is pop quizzes that I'm not going to be participating in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, just the, the point is a cancer, a, having a cancer, breast cancer, liver cancer, lung cancer, just realize not every cell, there is a bunch of different cell types in there. Okay. So, um, so this comes in your point, the essence of detecting cancer locally before it's spread. So survival rates, for example, are 95% if it's stage one. If it's gone to a couple lymph nodes, your survival rate drops to like 30. And if it's a lymph node, it's like 8%. So you can see finding stuff earlier is way better than finding it later. So, and the best approach is sort of a, a layered approach. And in your LifeScape, we try to do a bunch of screening tests, but we also offer some alternative tests, which I'll allude to, which would include some of the genetic testing, the full body MRI, which has some caveats. Um, and then that liquid biopsy, which is sort of a new thing where we can try to detect cancer in your bloodstream um, to see if you have a cancer that is completely undetectable by any other source, but we can find it in a quote unquote liquid biopsy. Interesting. Yeah. So, and are you going over any of the types of cancer or the um, stages of cancer? You said stage one, it's like discoverable and solvable more. Well, stage one, stage one small and stage two, three. I mean, the stages are all, you know. This is your pop quiz. That is my pop quiz. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there are different stages. You want to try to find it so it's local and not spread. Obviously, we do our best to prevent that, but sometimes the cancer is rapidly growing, and you know, before we even detect symptoms, it's it's everywhere, which is and the stage is based on size and type of growth and the speed of the growth, correct? It's it's a little of both. Yeah, it's basically where it's at. Is it in multiple areas? What's what's the general size? Um, and that's done through lots of different things after we screen for it. We're, we're again right now. We're just trying to screen for it. Got it. Um, so we take into family history, so that's why we go into details on family history. And again, the younger the person in your family that has it, the more likely it's more genetic. So if someone like your grandma has breast cancer at 92, that's more, you know, environmental exposures than, say, a genetic risk. Um, and then we also look at prevalence, obviously prevalence of a cancer. The higher the prevalence of cancer, for example, what we screen for typically is colon, breast, cervix, um, prostate, you know, those cancers are prevalent at those age groups, which makes the screening test, you know, a little more accurate. If we did the screening test and the prevalence is low, we'll get tons of false positives, tons of false negatives, and, you know, that it's not, not good. Not helpful. Not helpful. So in the screening piece of it, like, if you're a female, would you only look at the females in your family as genetic history, or is it just cancer in your family? Is it's just it general cancer, because, for instance, prostate and breast are an adenocarcinoma, which is a cell, certain cell type. So a, a family history of, like if I see here, if here a lineage of prostate cancer in males, and I have a female in front of me, I have to be thinking breast, 
too. So yeah. it's cell type, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's not just, so anyway, at your initial visit, and we usually go through the minutia of detail of what happened when, and again, some, some people come in, they're, they don't know, and I highly you know, tell them to find out, see what happens. But that's why you have to fill out those hundreds of pages of family history. Yes. Because it's helpful. It's very helpful. Yeah, very helpful. So we take into account family history prevalence. You know, you know, as we hit our 70s and 80s, we take into life expectancy because, you know, if you can do a screening test that's going to make you survive five more years and you're going to, your life expectancy is four years, it's probably not worth going through that process. And that's, that's always a discussion that's hard and difficult, but, but it, it takes into account, you know, your life expectancy. And then, you know, the best ideal screening test is it's cheap, it's inexpensive, it's easy to do, it's consistent. Um, so what we have right now is for colon, we have the colonoscopy or cologar test. Um, interestingly, the cancers we screen for are colon, prostate, breast, and cervix. They make up about 25% of cancer deaths. Hmm. So that means 75% of all the cancers we don't have great screening tests for, which is a little frustrating, um, but that's what we have at the moment. Is that because those are the most like prolific? Most prevalent, Yeah. Uh, the ones that are easier to do, mm -hmm. although colonoscopy is pretty easy. Um, mammograms, well, are they easy? Mm, I mean, <laughs> They're uncomfortable. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, is it, yeah, is there, I just thought like 25% of cancers we screen for, the other 75% we don't have great screening tests for. Now, we might, you know, as medicine progresses, hopefully we get more screening tests. Uh, but for 75% of the cancers out there, we, we don't, we can't really screen for it unless you have symptoms and that's not screening. Screening is asymptomatic, asymptomatic, you know, no symptoms screening. When you have symptoms, then it becomes a whole different ballgame. That's when we start doing imaging and stuff. So colon, we usually start about 45. It used to be 50. Um, and either we do a colonoscopy, or if you have family history of colon cancer, we, we recommend the colonoscopy. But there's a cologar test, which is just a simple stool test, which we use in someone who has low risk, you know, not great family histories, no, no genetic predispositions. We can do a cologar, which is just a massive stool test, and they look for DNA for Ab Simple though, because you... It's simple compared to not putting a tube up your rectum and well, we didn't yeah. have to get traffic. I was just, <laughs> the cola guard you do in your own home. Yeah, it's easy. And you have yeah. to figure easy. out how to put it in a bag. Or, well, it's you know. all self-contained. Okay. It's, 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 well, easy. it's got, as easy as it can be. You got gross first, so I was yeah. going <laughs> to take a step. Yeah. So colon, we started at 45. Uh, typically, if you have family histories, we start screening 10 years before. So if you'd said your mom had colon cancer at 50, or let's say 52, we start screening at 42. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Or if you have some genetic Lynch syndromes, or even if you have this inflammatory bowel disease, we start screening sooner. So there's certain things we use, but generally speaking, 45, we start colon. Prostate, say 50. Um, and then unfortunately, all men will probably either die with or die from prostate cancer. So a lot of prostate cancers are, you know, literally so slow growing, you're gonna die of something else. We're trying to really detect, you know, especially in 40s and 50s, is that aggressive cancer that spreads quickly to the bones. It's a different scenario when someone has prostate cancer and they're 82, you know, and there's definitely the intervention, like surgical intervention could end someone's life too. So you have to kind of weigh those into, into effect. Um, breast cancer, obviously mammograms, we start reviewing in your 40s. We do it every one to two years. Um, and then in family histories, we may consider breast MRIs in addition to mammograms. Um, but that really depends on family histories. Skin, you know, we're worried mostly about melanoma. Um, typically, if you have a family history of melanomas, we usually, I usually have you see a dermatologist every couple of years. Uh, but if you have like more than 50 moles, um, UV exposure, especially tanning beds, you know, we, you know, red hair, light eyes, those are all sort of risk factors for melanoma. Cervix, we start screening in your 20s for HPV related issues. And then lung, we, we, there was usually no screening test. Now we do screening tests in people sort of 50 to 80 that have, have a significant smoking history. And we can do that annually. So what's that test? That's a limited CT scan. So it means it, we don't radiate you as much as a full CT. So we do seven times less radiation, but we do that annually. And then we look for little nodules that might develop. Um, and being in Arizona, we see lots of tiny nodules, which are usually related to just infectious, post-infectious things or Old Valley fever, 
but obviously in someone who smokes, we have to kind of follow those nodules for several years to make sure they don't change. Okay. So those are the biggest things we screen for. Um, now we'll go into some alternative ones. Um, the gene test is where we look for the gene, the BRCA gene, and there's probably 25 to 40 other genes that are these tumor suppressing genes, tumor suppressing genes. If you have an error in that, then your body can't suppress something that's growing abnormally. Mm -hmm. So the ones that people are familiar with are the BRCA genes, but there's you know 40 to 50 of these. And again, you inherit one from mom, one from dad. Um, and if you inherit a bad one, you just your risk of cancer is up because you only have to have damage to one of those to then promote a cancer. Uh, you still need a bunch of other mutations, though. Um, you know, again, family history, any early age cancer, like someone who had 32 had whatever cancer, we just get more aggressive with those. But those is when we recommend either Color, Invite, or Ambry. They all have these are all companies that provide this test. And they're basically, again, checking for these tumor suppressant genes that you inherit. Um, the other one is a full body MRI with no contrast. So I have a few people that do this. Now, the caveat to this one is you do a full body head to thigh and you're looking for anything. So wow. um, the, the caveat to that is what if you find a little six millimeter spot in your liver? Let's just pretend it's benign. We don't know at the time. But we end up doing biopsies and images and more radiation and scans, and then it ends up that little six millimeter spot is benign. Well, now you've endured more radiation, interventions that could have caused bleeding or hospitalization or infections. So a full body MRI, they're getting better with this because they're doing some calculations and there's different types of MRIs they can do. They weight them differently. I don't know if you want to get into detail of that, but it's probably boring. Um, they look at T1, which looks at water or fat, and T2 looks at water and fat, and then they do this diffusion weighted, which is actually getting, getting these MRIs a little more accurate. And now they're coming up with some standards now, because previously I have MRIs from 10 years ago, they would just say, uh, there's this, 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 and this, and this, good luck, see what, and see what happens. Now they're actually giving us a classification saying, hey, there's a little spot here. It looks probably benign. Or so looks, this is a radiologist. Now, radiologist is commenting, yeah. Probably benign, maybe benign, looks a little funny, you know, oh, this looks suspicious, or this is highly suspicious. So now it gives us a little, little bit of triage space to say, hey, this one looks benign, let's just kind of watch it. Or if this one looks a little suspicious, maybe we, we end up doing some interventions. But the risk is, well, the benefit is finding a cancer earlier than anyone would ever dream of. But so as a doc, like how many times does that happen with you? I only have a few people that end up doing this. And, and anyway, nothing's come of it. Nothing's come up. Okay. Yeah. So I was interested in the accuracy. 95% of the time, it will find something. That doesn't mean it finds something dangerous. It just finds something. The incidental. Incidental. The incidental almost. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he likes that word. <laughs> and then 30% uh, of the time, you'll find something that requires some additional intervention. And then essentially what, what I've seen quoted is about a percent of the time they'll find a cancer. You know, half a percent to one percent. That's not over a lifetime, but each individual MRI. Um, but, you know, there's, again, potential physical harm with additional studies. And, you know, the emotional harm, like you're worried about this little spot. Yeah, that I mean, up. a lot of people can't handle that. No. But I would think that the people that are wanting to do the full body MRI might have some sort of family history that makes them concerned about it. I mean, but the, the psychology of the person who wants to do those. Yeah, they just is, want some, some people want to be super aggressive with everything and others don't. And that's just dependent on the person. But that's a test that we really haven't, that's not sort of commonly ordered. Um, but I think it's getting more data. And again, the radiologists are essentially physicists, you know, they're figuring out how to kind of change these things and factors to make them even more accurate. So I, I feel like this might be more standard of care in 10 years, but right now it's not. Um, the other one is liquid biopsy. Did you read liquid and need a drink? Yes, <laughs> that reminded me, subconscious. <laughs> So the one that's as being promoted at the moment is called the Grail test. And it's basically a, it's sort of like the MRI, because an MRI is like an image. Uh, liquid biopsy is basically, you know, basically a blood sample to try to detect any cancer. And they're, what, they're promote, what they're saying is it can detect up to 50 different cancers. So it's, it's what we call a multi-cancer 
early detection system. Um, Which I think is interesting because you only take a certain amount of vial of blood. And if let's say your analogy in the beat, like that cell is traveling, and if you don't get it in that one vial. Well, that's where false positives, false negatives would, would okay. potentially come up. Yeah. Um, right? Well, yeah. I mean, there's a certain concentration of, and what they're looking for in this test is it's, it's a cell free DNA. So um, it's basically DNA, for, and it's looking mostly for solid organs. So those solid organs will essentially shed a portion, not the actual cell itself, mm. but they can shed, you have cell turnover, right? Mm -hmm. So cell turnover, the cell, cancer cell dies, you know, cancer cell will eventually, you know, it dies, releases its cell, and then it gets, re gets uh, in the liver and it gets everywhere, and that's where we're trying to pick up, the cell-free DNA. Okay. So it's not the actual cell, because you're right, a cell to actually survive in the bloodstream would be different. Yeah. And that's what they used to do. They looked, they looked for a DNA in the cell. This is actually looking for cell-free DNA which means it's just sort of shed and like we'll the, pick it up. the garbage of the... The garbage, yeah. The, yeah, okay. Yep, and huh. now we can actually use that garbage. Um, That's interesting. Yeah, and, and again, technology in this area is, is massively improved. So now what they're trying to figure out is they look for the cell-free DNA and they look at the methylation patterns, which is just basically your DNA has these spots where meth methyl groups can sort of attach. And then they're comparing that to people who have actually had cancer and they try to match those, and they do that through algorithms and AI. So now, and the, the more data they get, obviously the more accurate this thing will become. So the bad thing about it is it doesn't detect um, encapsulated, like prostate is encapsulated, mm -hmm. so you're not gonna get cell-free DNA. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing, essentially bone marrow lymphomas. It, it's really, it's more for solid organs that we try to detect this. Um, and the target, same thing, about 50 to 79. We try to, again, this would be what, what I've heard is a layered approach to cancer prevention or cancer screening, meaning we have the standard things, colonoscopies, PSAs, mammograms. We have other things like full body MRIs. And then now we have this as a liquid biopsy. Which and, is new technology. Like which is new, new technology, yeah, yeah, it's totally new. I mean, I, I've, I've new, never, yeah. yeah, I've never ordered liquid biopsy until this year, or yeah, 2021. Um, and full bed MRI we've been doing for years, but again, it's getting a little more accurate. And, and again, it depends on the person. Someone's like, yeah, we'll just do the standard stuff, good. Someone who has a family history or wants to get more aggressive, we can sort of layer the approach and, and use these in concert, which I think is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, the data on this one was, so there's something called specificity and sensitivity. So. When something's very specific, it detects. Oh, so anyway, the Grail test is a great way of telling you if you do not have cancer. Oh, it's okay. not so a great. It's, ruling it, it's helping to rule it out. Yeah, it, but it's a great way to tell if you do not have cancer. But it's not the greatest way to say if you do have cancer. So those are these these things called specificity and sensitivity. So this one's a good one to say you do not have cancer. It's potentially ninety nine percent accurate in that in that fashion, which they state. I don't I don't know if that's true in a, I think when they did the studies, they had a high, higher prevalence of cancer in the group they studied, mm -hmm. which makes it a little more accurate. So it's, pro it's probably very accurate, but you can never rely on one test. But it's again, if you do this serially, potentially every one to three years. Or, um, well, the more the test is used, the more. The more accurate, accurate it, may, it may get, yeah. yeah. But it, it's used to see, again, it's, it's a great way to tell if you do not have cancer, it's not a great way to say you do have cancer, because it's not very accurate not in that fashion. Um, I don't know if we want to go down to treatment. It's kind of, well, let's just talk about it. Okay. Yeah, it's just a half hour, right? Yeah. Um, so we talked about how to screen for it. Now, now we're going to kind of talk into like, what if you have it, what are the means to get rid of it? Um, well, there's a, that whole section too of like the psychology of knowing you have it before you get to the treatment of it. Yes, that can be very overwhelming. Yeah, it, it can be. Or you, yeah, so that's all a mindset. So I guess as a psychologist, it's a mindset of, okay, you know, there's kind of two paths you can take generally, large paths. You can take the path of, okay, I've got this, what do I do? And let's be proactive and manage it and keep a positive outlook. Or you can kind of go into the woe is me, why is it me, what did I miss, and get angry and upset about it, which doesn't really help anyone personally, I don't think. Oh, you can um, go through those. You can go through both those phases too. Yeah, and, and like, get... clearly the 
thousands of words and things that you have and graphs that you have on your screen right now you're a data person mm -hmm. so like you would go into that data collecting part right and that would make you feel more comfortable like more so if people just well, well they're coming to me for expertise in this medical profession well i was thinking as a husband oh, okay. in, in oh, our, my yeah. situation like yeah. you jumped onto like you know boards and yeah. forums and things like that whereas me being the one with it i didn't do any of that so it was why kind of, because it doesn't, it didn't make me, it wouldn't have made me feel better. And I felt very positive that it, everything was going to be fine from the very beginning. You can, you can take that right. approach. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so how we approach it, you're a medical person. I'm a little person. more pragmatic. And obviously in medicine, I see all the, I see all the bad stuff, you know, I see right. all the bad outcomes. So, right. and, so and, it's, well, it's a fine line. So you have to be positive and like optimistic enough, but also cautious and pragmatic. Yeah, and that's so that's that's the, the, that's the line that you have to. Yeah, that's yeah. how I try to do it every day. Um, it's different you, when it's I, you. <laughs> well, how do I know that? Yeah, yeah, with your patients. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm always a worrier. That's 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 what has made me a good doctor. Is yeah. is I worry about the small things and try to anticipate what the next thing is going what, what the next thing is going to come. Yeah. And for, the, for the record, you weren't a worrier when we first met. In high I don't school. think I was. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you grew into that. I did quite well. <laughs> Um, so anyway, treatment. So treatment varies. I mean, obviously excision is done by a surgeon uh, and they remove the main cancer. Um, and as we've learned, you know, there, there can be cancers around surrounding that area. So um, what? that's where I got my vaccine. Oh, no, you did that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> this. oh this. Yeah. <laughs> that's right, my vaccine. Um, Lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> they take it out. Pain. They cut it out. <laughs> they excise it. Surgeon yeah. does it. Yeah. So they excise it. Um, and sometimes that's that's good enough. Uh, but, a little, but a lot of times when they cut it out, there's micro satellite. You know, there's little spots they can't really see visually. Um, and as we learned in breast cancer, you know, a one centimeter lesion is seen by a mammogram. But if it's a half a centimeter, it might be seen with an MRI, and if it's 0.3 centimeters, it's invisible to all that stuff. Yeah, which and is I, well, and I then think they, shocking to you. Yeah, it was, yeah, I mean, it was pretty. I mean, to me, it was like they. One of the surgeons, I went and talked to three surgeons. One of the surgeons said like it was. This has been developing for over 12 years um, because it was a ductal cancer, um, and it took time to get out of the duct. To your point, all that stuff. So that was kind of surprising. And then they called it deranged because when they did get in there and they cut it, like the, the edges of it or something looked worse, which actually made it a stage two versus stage one or grade three versus grade three, a, grade three, sorry, instead of a grade two. So it was, there's a lot of different things that happen when the surgeons go in there. It's surprising what they find. It, it could be different than the images that they even saw. Yeah, well, I'm very familiar with this because I have done MRIs on knees and it looks kind of mildly bad. And then the surgeon goes in and is like, this knee was a wreck. So, uh, we can't over rely. We can't overly rely on imaging, I and mean, we have to use imaging as a supplement to the clinical picture. Um, so again, in your case, you've learned now. Yeah. Depending on what image you use, things can be not missed. They're just not able to be seen with that techno with that not with that technology. Yeah. So, so anyway, surgery removes a large population of that. Again, one centimeter, a billion cells, um, but there could be micromets around that and then that's where radiation comes into fact. So we have excision, radiation, and chemotherapy. So excision, the surgeon does. Excision, they usually take the main thing out and then potentially a couple lymph nodes and, and we kind of, then we quote unquote stage it, see where it's at. Um, then radiation, basically we give you radiation like a CT scan, but in massive doses and in local areas. So if it's in your prostate, you're gonna get local beams that convene onto the prostate and treat a local prostate cancer. Same thing with breast or or if someone has colon cancer and it's metastasized to some other place, they might they might radiate the bone. Um, so radiation is very focal treatment to figure out and to kill those cells. Now obviously you get killing of other cells, which is the bad part about it, and yeah. you get damage and irritation and inflammation. Um, so, but that, but radiation is really to treat local therapies. So, if you just in case one of the the little cells that they can't see was left behind, correct, is the goal of that, right? Exactly. And then you have chemotherapies, which are really treating your body systemically for that p 
potential one cell that got out and is hanging out wherever, your liver or your bone, that one cell that could potentially replicate over a course of ten, five, 10 years, and then the chemotherapy kills that cell. Obviously, again, you get side effects with that too. Um, but you don't really know, sometimes it, they're not telling you to do that right away. Like we have a friend who had um, testicular cancer and they were pretty sure they encapsulated it, got the whole thing that, you know, they thought that everything was fine. And then was it like a year later or six months later, they found it like in his neck. In one of his lymph nodes. So yeah, that's 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 the kind of crazy. It's great. I mean, to think about it, again, it's local, then it spreads, and then it spreads. But one cell can get out, and it's not going to be visible to anybody, uh, and you have no symptoms with that. And that's where, again, that's where we try to do these supplemental things like radiation, and chemotherapies, and then in breast cancer, prostate cancer, you know, fortunately, some of those cancers are responsive to hormones, yeah. and we can give you anti-hormones to stop the growth of that one cell that might have escaped. Um, so it doesn't grow, you're just, you're cutting out the fuel supply for that cancer. Right, and and in, I have a couple cancer patients, you know, 20 years out and they're on tamoxifen and, you know, they might have a cell here or there, but it's not gonna do anything. 20 years out, yeah. you're still on that. Yeah, Wow. well, one actually went off of it, then had a recurrence, then went back on it. Um, but but chemo those hormone therapies are really just to basically make it static you know mm. who, who cares you know live 10 years you'll die of something you know we're, we're all gonna die you know we, we die no, of something it took a dark <laughs> turn here we go it takes a very dark no turn. i mean we always think about you know everything's so like i'm gonna live forever we're not we're not gonna live forever i think we need to be i think doing hospice you learn yeah true you don't you don't want to talk about all these things on your deathbed you want to be able to do all the things in your life and if you're aware you're gonna die you, you tend to do things you know that are fun you know, like you put the, I mean, if you think you're gonna die in five years you're gonna do lots of things in the well, next five years settle down <laughs> <laughs> I hear can see your list for me right now <laughs> yeah um, so, anyway, so radiation is teach local chemo is to really treat chemical and then we have this subtype where um, some home hormones can be used for prostate and and, and, um, and breast. Um, so I found this really interesting with chemotherapies. Uh, some some uh, oncologist said he 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 correlated it to uh, a population of moths. Mm. So there's all these moths. You have a million moths, and they're extremely sensitive to this pesticide, which would be a chemotherapy, right? So you mm -hmm. give them this chemotherapy. Well, you're you're technically probably not going to kill all of them because some are you know there's a variance. Just some, like some are going to hold their breath. Some hold their breath for long years. Yeah, <laughs> some hold their breath, some won't. Um, but the chemotherapy is initiated, and then you kill off like eighty percent of them, which mm -hmm. looks great because you do scans. You're like, oh my gosh, it's shrink. The tumor's shrinking. The moths are going away. But then you're left with those twenty percent, which are now then a little more resistant to that same oh. pesticide. So that's when in chemotherapies they'll start to use a combination, or they'll use one, they'll switch to another one, then go to, the, the logic is, and again, like I said before, all those cancer cells, one cancer, let's say you have breast cancer, that breast cancer has, you know, 100, 200 variations of, and not every cell is exactly the same. Mm -hmm. Some have 200 mutations, this other one has 10 mutations. So again, that pesticide or that chemotherapy will kill a majority of those, but potentially it doesn't kill all of them, those 20% that remain then become a little more virulent and then you have to switch chemotherapy. So I thought that was kind of interesting, the, the million moth yeah. sort of resistance. Um, and then we talked about hormones and then there's some immunotherapies, you know, melanoma. I mean, Jimmy Carter had that melanoma and I think it was in his brain and then he went on immunotherapies, which, which controlled, I think he survived another few years, which, you know, 15 years ago, someone with melanoma that had spread, you know, it was a three to six month lifespan. Um, so there's some immunotherapies that are new too. Um, so I think that was all I wanted to cover. Do you have any questions? What about, what about, do you quizzes? have any, yeah, do you have quizzes? Um, like across the years of having people that have been diagnosed with cancer, you've, you've diagnosed with cancer, like as a doctor, you, you tend to, and people don't see the personal side of you, take it hard you know, you'll come home and you'll be upset or sad and, you know, you have favorite patients and yeah. you're like, dang it, like, you know, because it's, 
they've done, they really haven't done anything wrong in that situation and they've got cancer and now they have to deal with it. Do you have any like patient stories in terms of like how they manage it? Like some manage it better than others or? Who's they, the person? The patients, yeah, with you. I, I see such a variety. I, I see people are in denial or they get angry or and people that just say, okay, what's the next step, doc? You know, let's, 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 let's do it. Um, I don't know if there's a, and, and again, people that are angry or denial, they'll, they'll, they'll switch, you know, mm -hmm. what are the stages of grief? Yeah. Stages of grief. Yeah. Anger, denial, bereavement, acceptance, um, depression, depression. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, no, I mean, it, it varies. And the, the same person that's angry one day will come back and be like, okay, well, let's just, do it. you know, everyone goes through stages and I think that's normal. Um, I don't know if it affects outcomes. I feel like, I feel like the angrier ones, are the ones that get more pissed off, tend to tend to do a little better than mm -hmm. than maybe the ones that are like, ah, whatever. Um, but I don't think there's any studies on that. Um, I think definitely having a you mean there's no studies on your subjective observations. Yeah, I don't have it. I'm not quoting it. I'm not going to quote a study I haven't seen. Right, <laughs> right, right. Like someone I know. Um, but, but I guess the point is, there's a lot of there's a lot of reasons why, and there's a lot of treatments, and there's a lot of interventions that can happen, and it's really paying attention to your body, and making good choices for yourself. Right. Yeah. I mean, essentially, I think it was forty percent of cancers are caused by some environmental exposure, and then you get, you multiply that by four. So someone eating McDonald's every day, you know, smoking, and you know, they're you know, you're not going to get cancer and it's not like you cause cancer. It's those risk factors that you're trying to mitigate and try to make as small as possible. Because the other part of the equation is your genes, which you have no control over. Um, and exposures, you know, microplastics, who know, you know, exposure, you get smog, you know, you can't do much. So right. the only thing you do is change your behaviors and maybe check for these genes if you, if you might be at higher risk and, and do all the screening tests. And then if you want to be a little more aggressive, we can consider the GRAIL test, which has some caveats, the MRI, which has some caveats. Um, and as long as you're aware of those, we can sort of, again, I think the, the layered approach is kind of a cool aspect now. Before it was just like colon, got to do a colonoscopy every five years. You know, it was so like, so rote. Now it's a little more nuanced. Uh, nuanced. Yeah, you can really treat the person in front of you. Yeah. So we'll end on that note. Okay. 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 <laughs> All right. <laughs> Have a good holiday, everybody. See you soon. Happy holiday.